Okay, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh Ladies and gentlemen, Alhamdulillah This evening we are very delighted to have these two prominent and very distinguished speakers uh, for this program IS Wabina on Islam and Future Studies uh, Tan Sri Emeritus Professor Dr. Muhammad Kamal Hassan Indeed, uh, we don't have any introduction on him is the former rector of IUM and also Datuk Dr. Uh, Muhammad Daud Baka, also a former of staff of UIM and then as also the former deputy rector of student affairs of IUM. Uh, so, uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan, how are you? Alhamdulillah, okay. by the grace of Allah, I'm all right. Alhamdulillah, thanks God we, we can meet uh, tonight and sharing with the audience about the subject matter and also how are you Dr. Daud? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Future Studies has recently gained renewed attention worldwide. It is a field of study that tries to map possible, probable and preferable futures for humankind. Research in the field includes the systematic, interdisciplinary and holistic study of social technological and environmental advancement. Historically, the birth of future studies was triggered by humanity's realization of the need to and prevent the repeat of past global conflicts, such as World War II and the Cold War, and predict future catastrophes. With the current pandemic COVID-19 situation shaking humanity to the core, as well as the looming environmental and global crisis. There is an urgent need for serious thinking and planning for our future. Future studies, without a doubt, is the way forward. To this pursuit, there are numerous dedicated courses, journals, projects, and even institutes set up for this purpose. In the mix of all of these global developments, Islam's position remains relatively unexplored as one of the prime civilizational forces that molded human history in the past, Islam contains the rich source of wisdom regarding the future. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, please join us in this interesting webinar on Islam Future Studies, featuring these two most prominent futuristic thinking scholars in our Muslim world today. Before I pass over uh, to the first speaker, Prof. Tan Sri Kamal Hassan, just I, I, I think I need to just brief you about your, your bio data or profile so that people should know better uh, of your background. Tan Sri Emeritus Professor Dr. Muhammad Kamal Hassan was born in Pasir Mas, Kelantan. Then he attended an English school that, is, that was Sultan Ismail School in Kota Baru. He had his first degree in Islamic studies from University of Malaya in 1965, and he got his master's and PhD degrees from Columbia University, New York. He became the head of the Department of Husuluddin and Philosophy at UKM in 1979, and got his professorship there. He began his career at International Islamic University, Malaysia, IEM, as Sheikh of Kulia in 1983. He became the first dean of the Kulia of Islamic Religion Knowledge and Human Sciences, IUM, and the rector of IUM from 1999 to 2006. He's currently working as this is what I got. Uh, if, uh, if there is not the current status, please correct me, uh, Prof. He's currently, he's currently working at IUM as a professor. Chancery, Professor Dr. Kamal Hassan is a is, this is the, the version that we got before, but as you have just recently told me, you were, you was, uh, you were the uh, distinguished professor or known as Professor Ulong before this. And of course, distinguished professors in Malaysia are state-owned icons as their contributions transcend the institution they represent. The focus of Prof. Kamal Hassan's writings are mainly on philosophy, religion, social issues and education. Some of his famous works include the Encyclopedia of Malaysia, Regions and Beliefs, 
Islamic identity crisis in the Muslim community in Contra Malaysia, Islamic studies in Contemporary Southeast Asia, journal observation, and so many other publications. Our second speaker, Dato Dr. Dr. Mahmoud Daud Baka, who is also my senior when we were in College Islam Kelang, received his early education at Sekolah Kebangsaan Sungai Korok, Baru Alusta Kedah in 1970 until 1976, Maktak Mahmud 1977 until 1979, and College Islam Klang in 1980 until 1983. 1980 until 1983. Next, he furthered his studies in Sharia and University of Kuwait in 1983 until 1988, and he got his PhD from University of St. Andrews, United Kingdom uh, in 1993 has been appointed as the 8th president of the IUM, effective from 1st July 2019 until 30th June 2022. As I mentioned before, he was the deputy director, student affairs, uh, from 2002 and 2005 at IUM. He began his career as a lecturer back in 1989. As a former staff of IUM, he has much adapted with IUM environment. Currently, he's a chairman of MAWIP and also chairman of trustee holder Yapim. He also serves as a member of Sharia Advisory Panel for Islamic Finance Institution in Malaysia and abroad. Moreover, he's also the founder of Amani Advisors and Islamic Finance Advisory Company. Years after that, he obtained his second degree. This is quite interesting. Eh? In jurisprudence from University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, that was in 2002. In 2014, Dr. Baka received the most outstanding individual award by Yang di Pertuan Agong in conjunction with the national level Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam birthday. In 2016, he then received the award of excellence for outstanding contribution for Sharia Advisory at London Sukuk Summit Awards and Sharia Advisor Award at the Asset Triple A Islamic Finance Award. His publications include articles in various academic journals and presentations of more than 150 papers in both local and international conferences. His first book entitled Sharia Minds in Islamic Finance, an inside story of a Sharia scholar, has warned the Islamic Finance Book of the Year 2016 by the Global Islamic Finance Award, Kifa. His latest book, this is what I understood, on Makasid Sharia, the face and voice of Sharia, has just been out a couple of days ago, but I was uh, mentioned by him just, I think it will be out soon, but uh, we hope that uh, we can read the book, inshallah. Until today, Dr. Dadok Bakar has been active and a well-known supporter of Islamic finance. With that brief background of two prominent speakers, I would like to call upon Prof. Kamal Hassan to start with uh, the first presentation on the subject matter. Over to you, uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتديا لولا أن هدانا الله أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Alhamdulillah, I am most grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, by his grace and by his mercy, I'm able to participate in this uh, Islam and Futures webinar. Let me uh, also welcome my uh, dear brother, Dr. Bakar, Daud Bakar, the president of IIUM. Uh, he is my boss now, um, and uh, we look forward, uh, I look forward to uh, learning from him because he has been a prolific writer and thinker and um, always uh, opening up new horizons uh, in the field of uh, Islamic studies. Uh, my paper uh, is entitled Islam and future studies <clears throat> and I have divided it into um, parts 
the introduction, then uh, number two, the part two, the worldview of the Quran defines for humankind the ultimate future of mankind. And then um, the third part uh, is about the future's thinking and planning of post-colonial Muslim nations. And the fourth part is some predictions of the world-bound future studies. And then uh, we come uh, to the um, conclusion, uh, another future of future studies. Let me uh, take you through this uh, presentation with first the introduction. I would like to begin with the following premises. The future's thinking and planning of individuals is usually based upon how far the future is conceived in the mind of the individual. For most people, the future ends with death. The future's thinking and planning of a people is also based on how far the future extends in the imagination or belief of the people. As for the future's thinking and planning of governments, states and nations, they are usually based upon their respective conceptions of the future or how they each conceive uh, of their futures. Uh, the worldviews of capitalism, communism, existentialism, socialism, fascism, postmodernism, or liberal democracy also determine how futures are conceived, studied, or articulated by the proponents. Similarly, the worldview of Islam, as contained in the Quran, shapes or dictates the particular way futures are conceived, understood, or studied by its adherents. Unfortunately, some Muslims conceive of the future as confined only to existence on planet Earth, while some Muslims prefer to focus only on the future of life after death and neglect the great leadership and management responsibilities that Islam has placed upon the shoulders of Muslims. The third group of Muslims, and I believe uh, that Dr. Daud, uh, myself, and Dr. Azam belong to this third group of Muslims who are conscious of their worldly responsibilities of khilafah or vicegerency of the earth, uh, emphasize the twin roles of Aymara and Islah. Aymara, the proper management or proper development of the world, and Islah, valorization and ethical reform in the world, which includes the sacred duty of enjoining that which is right and good and prohibiting that which is wrong and bad, or al amru bil ma'ruf wa nahyu anil munkar. They regard the future as going far beyond the worldly existence, unlike their secular counterpart, and as transcending a dunya. But the worldview of the Quran gives them the right understanding, that is, the right tasawwur, that in order to attain permanent goodness and holistic. Uh, well-being in the hereafter, it is their duty to live fully in this world. They cannot escape this world. They're not supposed to escape this world. The world was made for them to, to work in uh, and, and produce all that is good uh, in this uh, worldly existence. Uh, and, and, and the dunya is the domain of human striving uh, for moral excellence and for peaceful and a beneficial construction of a God-conscious civilization. So the goal is civilization. It's not just establishment of the religion, iqamatul deen, but also uh, iqamatul habara, uh, as-saliha. This is um, the precondition for the ultimate and eternal well-being in the future of al-akhirah or the ukhrawi future. Uh, they know that as, as believers, this is the third group of, of Muslims I'm referring to. This is the mainstream Muslim group. Uh, they know that they have to strive hard 
to spread goodness, truth, and righteousness in this present life, to oppose as obedient servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the forces of falsehood, uh, forces of atheism, of defiance of divine sovereignty and deception. The vision of the future is guided by the divine principle of striving for goodness in this world, hasana fid dunya, and goodness uh, in the hereafter, hasana fil akhirah, by which they hope to gain true success and well-being, or al-falah, and avoid the destiny of true loss, or al-khusran. Now I come to the second part of my uh, presentation. That is, the worldview of the Qur'an defines for mankind the ultimate future of mankind. The Qur'an is replete with references to the ultimate future of mankind, the end of life on earth, and the final destruction of the cosmos by the will of the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many different words are used to describe the awesome and terrifying events of the final day, but the primary conceptions of the ultimate future are represented by the following words, and these are uh, most of the words being used in the Quran uh, to, to convey the idea of uh, uh, the hereafter. The first is al akhirah uh, the hereafter. Yawmuddin, the day of judgment. al yawmul akhir the last day. al the last hour. Al-Masir, the, the end, the destiny, the ending with Allah. al marja uh, the return with Allah, Al-Jannah, Paradise, Al-Jahannam, Hell, Ajal, the appointed time, Liqa Al-Rabb, meeting with the Lord, Liqa Allah, meeting with Allah, Liqa Al-Akhirah, meeting with the hereafter, and the word Khadin, tomorrow, meaning the hereafter. The Quran repeatedly reminds human beings in several places of the inescapable, inescapable ultimate meeting, Liqa, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using various derivatives more than 30 times, uh, such as liqa'ana, liqa'ihi, um, and, and so on. Uh, in Surah Al-Kahfi, the Quran reminds mankind as follows. Those are the ones who refuse to believe in the revelations of their Lord, and they are bound to, and that, and that they are bound to meet Him. Hence, all their deeds have come to naught, and we shall assign no weight to them on the day of resurrection. Uh, in Surah, um, in the same Surah, 110, Ayat 110, uh, it says, "Pull in nama ana Say, O Muhammad, I am no more than a human being like you, one to whom revelation is made. Your Lord is the one and only God. Hence, whoever looks forward to meet his Lord, let him do righteous works and let him associate none with the worship of his Lord. And um, uh, another surah, uh, Surah Yunus, verse 11, وَلَوْ يُعَجِّلُ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ الشَّرَّ اسْتِعْجَى لَهُمْ بِالْخَيْرِ لَقُضِيَ إِلَيْهِمْ أَجَلُهُمْ فَنَذَرُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَنَا فِي تُغْيَانِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ so were Allah to listen, uh, to hasten to bring upon men uh, the consequences of evil in the way men hasten in seeking the wealth of this world, their term would have long since expired. Uh, but that is not our way. So Allah wants to give them time to come back to Allah, to, to aspire to meet Him. So we leave alone those who do not expect to meet us, that they may blindly stumble in their transgression. Uh, and then in the next verse, Allah uses the word khadin, tomorrow, to refer to the hereafter, and reminds everyone to be aware of what he or she has done for his or her life in the hereafter if she or he were to avoid the terrible punishments in the everlasting future 
called tomorrow, a word that conveys the sense of nearness and immediacy. Um, and uh, the, the verse reads, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghadin wa attaqu Allah inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amaloon. Believers, fear Allah and let every fear and every person look to what he sends forward for the morrow. Fear Allah, Allah is well aware of all that you do. One word that Allah uh, repeats 115 times, subhanallah, 115 times in the Quran is al-akhirah, the hereafter, which goes to show uh, Allah's supreme concern that human beings become highly conscious of the reality of al-akhirah, its inevitability and its paramount significance for the sound construction of human civilization on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it crystal clear that the present life, <clears throat> the present life is a brief and temporary period. It is provided by Allah to be a period of divine trial and uh, examination uh, whose results would only be known in al-akhirah. Allah's warning to those who do not expect to meet us, liqa'ana, because they are so engrossed and satisfied with the world, or with the life of this world, uh, is a severe punishment in hell. Um, now, the attitude of true believers, and uh, we hope we are included among the true believers, yeah, all of us uh, this evening, <clears throat> uh, the attitude of true believers is just the opposite of the disbelievers. They have total conviction in the hereafter, while the disbelievers uh, forget the reality of the hereafter. And they are prepared to face the test and tribulations in this life because they know that this life is meant for testing and tribulation and striving. And this is not a place to find uh, rest. They are willing to make great sacrifices of their wealth and lives for the sake of everlasting bliss in the final future, they always remember the final future, the final future. And in uh, 17 times a day when they read uh, Surah Al-Fatiha in, in the prayers, uh, they are being reminded of uh, Malik Yawmiddin, that Allah is a sovereign of the day of judgment. 17 times the, the true believers are being reminded. How can they forget? How can they be negligent? How can they make this uh, something um, a, a minor concern in their life. Uh, from their study of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, they understand that Islam wants all human beings uh, to understand that the future does not stop in this world. It extends beyond this mundane, ephemeral and transient world to the everlasting uh, 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 hereafter. It is in the final, final end that they will be meeting their creator, master, and sustainer. So the true believers uh, are uh, expecting this liqa uh, Allah uh, in the hereafter. Whereas uh, the majority of human beings uh, in today's world, uh, their future is confined to this world uh, and Allah has no place uh, in their uh, vision of the future. Human beings, uh, according to Islam, are supposed to know um, if they study the Quran, uh, that in this world, human beings are not the only effective agents of change or makers of history. There are transcendent beings playing the unseen roles, such as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels. And then there are invisible beings who are committed to do evil, Iblis and his host, Satan, uh, and, and jinns, and uh, uh, Hizb al-Shayateen. Not all events, therefore, in human life are due only to human acts and willpower. There is the overarching and all-powerful will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is uh, emphasized in the worldview of Tawheed. But he has made the world as the main playing field of human beings to carry out the God-given responsibilities of servanthood, obudiyya, stewardship, khilafa. Uh, and also the development, uh, Aymara, uh, and also Islah, 
reforming uh, the world uh, and by becoming the defenders of truth and uh, opponents of that which is false and evil. I come to the third uh, uh, part of my, my paper, and that is the futures thinking and planning of post-colonial nations. Just a brief statement, because uh, I want you, uh, our viewers, to understand that uh, that the, the the mainstream Muslim uh, understanding of of the futures um, uh, is is uh, derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, and they, as true believers, try to uh, implement what the Quran uh, has uh, laid down for them. But uh, the the post-colonial Muslim nations after independence, um, they were uh, Muslim nations were led by the secular westernized elites, you know, secular westernized elites. Uh, and these elites were planning for the future of the Muslim nations uh, according to the secular model and according to the ideology of development and modernity implemented by the technologically advanced Western or Eastern nations in the post-war era. Now, they, during the colonial period, the Islamic reformists, so we have a group of, of, of Muslim uh, who uh, do not want to be uh, uh, do not want to be controlled by the colonial uh, systems. Uh, they articulated a vision of the Muslim future in which Muslims would be completely liberated from the four secular models of independence, uh, progress, and modernity. Very important concepts, independence, progress, and modernity. But the Islamic reformists understand this differently from the secular uh, colonial um, uh, elites. Um, and the, the Islamic da'wah movements of the 70s uh, strongly supported the reformist and renewalist um, models in opposition to the nationalist uh, narratives of development and progress. So within the Muslim nations, you have the struggle between the secular nationalists, uh, Muslims, uh, westernized Muslims, and the Islamic reformists and renewalists, and later on also the followers of the Da'wah movements. I think Dr. Daud uh, was one of the uh, leaders of the Da'wah movements in the 70s from College Islam. Um, um, now, but the dominance, uh, the dominance of the nationalist movements uh, prevail in the post-colonial period. Uh, in, in Malaysia, during the time of Al-Marhum Tunku Abdul Rahman, may Allah bless him. But he was, he was a representative of, of the secular nationalists. However, with the uh, advent of the 21st century, the weaknesses of the conventional models. And now I think with the, uh, when, when the world entered 2000, uh, the 21st century, um, about um, <clears throat> 21 years ago, two decades ago, uh, we begin to see the weaknesses of the conventional models of, of, the, of, of the future, uh, either in terms of progress, modernity and so so on uh, these uh, weaknesses are being exposed and once again the muslim nationalist leaders uh, are being urged by the reformist uh, islamic intellectuals and one of them is uh, dr daud baka in front of you is among the reformist uh, islamic intellectuals um, urging writing uh, debating uh, to abandon the secular models and reconsider adopting the alternative paradigm of holistic development and progress as envisioned in the Quran. Now I come to the fourth part of my paper. Uh, I am, these are some of the predictions of uh, future studies uh, from uh, Western uh, perspectives. Um, on the basis of their respective worldviews, uh, dominant discourses and narratives, Western nations continue 
to plan for their preferred futures. Uh, this is one thing good about Western nations. They have been planning, um, uh, you know, uh, well, I think ever since uh, the First World War and the Second World War, uh, because they've been fighting one another. So all the Western nations were planning while the Muslim nations were sleeping. Uh, so this is one thing that we should learn from the Western. Uh, however, the Western nations' uh, vision of the future is confined only to the world. It's a question of uh, who is going to be on top. Is it communism or is it capitalism? Is it socialism or is it liberal democracy? Uh, but uh, the, the, the Muslim nations were, were sleeping uh, and, and dreaming and not really planning uh, for their futures, whether in this world or beyond this world. Now, uh, uh, some nations, uh, in fact, this is becoming a, a global uh, movement now, uh, the idea of gross national happiness uh, has, uh, has come to replace uh, the idea of uh, gross domestic product. And we have seen this uh, in the case of, uh, of Bhutan. Uh, when Bhutan decided to uh, to come up with gross national happiness uh, as an indicator of, of uh, the uh, the progress of the nation, rather than looking uh, at the number of uh, uh, dollars and cents uh, in the national banks. Uh, since then, there is now the World Happiness Index and World Happiness Ranking issued by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and there is also the International happiness day. Now, uh, it doesn't matter how uh, this happiness is defined. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, they have come up with something to provide uh, a solution, an alternative uh, to the economic uh, vision of, of progress. I think they're looking at more at the non-economic factors. And so when they talk about uh, of international happiness, they, they're looking at how uh, people feel about things almost they may be poor people but they feel good so th that is taken into account so alhamdulillah is uh, development uh, in that sense and uh, in the 2021 world happiness ranking Malaysia stands at uh, uh, 81st place which is among the top ranking of happy nations so uh, whether uh, people are happy or not uh, at least Malaysia has been ranked as uh, number 81, and that is among the top, top tier, the top tier, uh, 81 place. You have another, what, 21 places to be at the top. Um, uh, and then um, I like to quote also from the New Scientist Journal published in the USA. The New Scientist takes uh, the whole of humanity to greater heights extending the future of the world beyond 2050 to reach 2076. How they came to 2076, I, I still don't know, because we in IUM, we are planning for 2077. Um, uh, but um, the, the new scientists, uh, I, I'm giving you four predictions. The world in 2076, machines will outsmart us, but we will still be on top. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, not AI be on top. And uh, number two, uh, the world in 276, 2076, the theory of everything is here, uh, we think. So this is what, um, you know, uh, what scientists uh, have been uh, looking for, uh, the theory of everything. Uh, and they think by 2076, they will get it. And then in number three, a third prediction is the world in 2076, Human-made life forms walk the earth. So don't be uh, surprised in 2076, you see your neighbors uh, walking and they are robots uh, from, from uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and these robots uh, may be speaking many languages. While you speak one or two languages, these robots can speak 10, 20 languages because it's all programmed within uh, the robotic uh, mind. Uh, then, um, so the, the new scientists came up with this tagline, we have seen the future and it will blow your mind. Now, uh, a more realistic um, prediction is given by the World Economic Forum 
uh, in June 2020, uh, June 23rd, the World Economic Forum came up with 17 technology production uh, predictions for 2025, another, another four years, uh, which constitutes uh, a plausible future uh, as far as uh, technological advancements uh, is concerned. Uh, I will quickly uh, read through the 17 predictions, and these are these are wonderful uh, predictions, and we hope uh, they are true because this is uh, there's nothing wrong with it from the Islamic point of view. Number one is AI optimized manufacturing. Uh, number two, a far-reaching energy transformation. Number three, a new era of computing is already here. Number four, healthcare paradigm shift to prevent through diet. So instead of drugs, uh, diet will be the, uh, the, 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 the new uh, paradigm. And uh, 5G will enhance the global economy and save lives. Now, some nations already have 5G. Japan has 5G. Maybe we have, we're talking later about 6G. And, and a new normal in managing cancer, uh, that, that is good news for those with cancer. And then uh, there'll be robotic retail. So retail shopping will be done by robots. Uh, and then number eight, a blurring of physical and sp virtual spaces. Number nine, putting individuals, uh, not institutions, at the heart of healthcare. Number 10, the future of construction has already begun. So uh, different ways of constructing, different elements to use for construction and so on. And then uh, number 11, a gigaton scale uh, CO2 removal will help to reverse climate change. That, that would be great if you can reverse climate change and emergencies, uh, that would be great. And then um, uh, a new era in medicine, closing the wealth gap, a clean energy revolution supported by digital twins, understanding the microscopic secrets hidden on surfaces, and then machine learning and AI expedite decarbonization in carbon heavy industries. And number seven, 17, privacy is pervasive and prioritized. That's good. I thought our privacy will be invaded and we'll have no more privacy, but they are predicting that privacy will be privatized. And that, that's great. And I come to the conclusion. My conclusion is an entitled, Another Future of Future Studies. Despite the obvious differences between the Islamic perspective on futures and mainstream future <laughs> studies in the West, which do not take into account transcendent or supranatural variables in human lives and human futures, Islamic worldview-based future studies can and should benefit from some of the useful methods and approaches developed, particularly by people like Ziauddin Sardar and his group of uh, futurists and uh, people like uh, Professor Sohail Inayatullah and his colleagues uh, and, and they, this, uh, some of their ideas and concepts are as follows. One is complexity, extended present scenarios, casual layered analysis, uh, futures triangle, trend analysis, environmental scanning, visioning, uh, the six pillars, simulation and modeling, scenario planning, emerging trends, post-normal times, unthought future scenarios, metaphors, black swans, black jellyfish, backcasting, etc. And there are many more that we can benefit uh, from the mainstream uh, Western future studies. However, uh, Islamic worldview-based future studies should address the failings and weaknesses uh, in the futures thinking and planning of Muslim nations by showing how they have deviated from the approaches and methodologies provided by divine wisdom and divine revelation. The COVID-19 pandemic, the SDGs, the climate emergencies, the uncertainties, the calamities and turbulence of the near future are opportunities for the proponents of the Islamic worldview to open the eyes of the of lost humanity and forgetful Muslim nations uh, uh, to the realities and true promises of the ultimate futures contained in the grand, richer, and truer narratives of Al-Akhirah 
Yawmuddin and uh, Liqa'ullah. Now that IUM has a UNESCO chair for future studies in the person of Professor Suhail Inayatullah, in addition to the future studies unit in the uh, Kulia of Islamic Review Knowledge and Human Sciences, while USIM has its own future studies program, it is possible to envisage, and uh, this is, I hope, uh, will be taken up further, to envisage the formation of a Malaysian Islamic worldview-based future studies, MIW. BFS, which developed the Islamic paradigm of future studies. This paradigm, when fully developed, could be the game changer, as other conventional schools fail to recognize that history does not stop in the world, but extends to another realm of existence, the realm of al-akhirah. And worse still, they fail to recognize the existence and authority of the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is my hope and I'm uh, uh, finishing now. This is my uh, last uh, sentence, a very long sentence. It is my hope that the MIWBFS School of Thought will be able to initiate and create new areas of future studies, such as A, the study of spiritual futures of man, B, Islamic eschatological implications on worldly planning, C, religious eschatologies, as a domain of future studies. D, Quranic perspective on the role of satanic forces in uh, influencing human behavior. E, comparative futures uh, vision from religious scriptures of world religions. In other words, we can look at different religions, uh, how different religions look at uh, the futures uh, uh, um, uh, respectively. And then F, Islamic critique of Western uh, future studies. We should have an Islamic critique of Western future studies, but we also should have an Islamic critique of Muslim futures planning in the past and the present. And we hope IIUM will be leading uh, in this critique of both the Western and the Muslim. And, um, and, and finally, futures planning up to the year 2077, uh, uh, which coincides with the advent of the 16th century Hijriya, the dawn of the Ummah Wasat to play, to play the role of shuhada uh, unto mankind as far as justice, al adl moral excellence, al khairiyah and proper existential balance, and tawazun bayn al-ifrat, wat tafreed, or i'tidal are concerned. That is uh, my humble presentation. I uh, back your... Um, Pardon for any mistakes and shortcomings. I thank you very much for your patience, uh, especially to my dear uh, brother, uh, President uh, Dr. Dr. Daoud uh, Bakar. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Shukran jazilan. Prof. Kamal Hassan. It is in, indeed. And very lighting presentation. I think, uh, uh, I mean, very interesting. I think there are some points of progressive. I think, but uh, nevertheless, I think towards the end of your presentation, I think you gave some of the ideas what have been done, uh, both at RIUM as well as USIM to take up these future studies. And that would be something that I think the very important part that. Uh, how that we take uh, care of this from the Islamic perspective. And, and I think you have also shared with the 17 predictions of what uh, the world would be in 2076. And I think the projects that being, uh, I mean, uh, taking in both at IUM as well as USIM uh, at the, uh, during that time and until 2077. And I think the question here is how can we Muslims uh, get involved with this? And as you have mentioned in your presentations, uh, the majority of the Muslims, we would like that whatever that we have done on this earth, the ultimate thing is we want to have the hasana fit dunya and hasana fit akhirah. And of course, the hereafter is the uh, the the, the, the last journey that we are going to. With that, we would like to thank again uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan for that fantastic presentation. And I think we will be sharing the papers of Prof. Kamal Hassan on our website as, as well as of our other uh, platforms. 
Um, we now move to the second speaker, Dr. Daud Baka. Uh, Dr. Daud Baka, uh, over to you, Dr. Daud. Thank you. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khayri qalqihi wa khayri al-anam. Wa sayyidi al-mursaleen, sayyidina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallama amma ba'd. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, respected Dr. Azam Adil, the moderator for this evening session. Respected and beloved uh, Professor Tan Sri Dr. Makmal Hassan, the uh, always mentor and teacher, and also the inspirator for many of us. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for taking part uh, in this great presentation. Um, and also my distinguished uh, uh, audience participant from all over the world. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A very good uh, evening or good afternoon, or uh, even good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, it is always challenging to be speaking after uh, Prof. Uh, Kamal Hassan has spoken. Uh, so this is uh, another unnecessary pressure that you are, uh, you know, uh, carrying with you uh, in this kind of forum together with uh, an iconic uh, scholar like Professor Dr. Muhammad Kamal Hassan. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I will try to uh, leverage on uh, some of the points that Prof. Kamal Hassan has spoken just now. Uh, on top of that, I will try to uh, chip in and to bring my own perspective uh, as a younger uh, individual compared to Prof uh, from his experience, what I have seen and what uh, I have been uh, uh, cultivating or perhaps uh, uh, observing the trends of the world, starting from the pinpoints of the world as we are living and having at the moment all the way to the next uh, 40, 50 years, all the way to 100 years from now. And before I do that, uh, allow me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, to uh, start by uh, sharing some of the beautiful Quranic verses, uh, alluding perhaps to the mindset of the future. Because, you know, somehow uh, due to unknown reason, uh, Muslim scholars and laymen alike, we were not encouraged to think about the future of this world uh, to develop and to govern and to sustain the world in favor of the Muslim people to, and to live and enjoy in this world according to the Sharia, according to the desired aspiration of the Quran. Because the Quran was revealed essentially to build the life in this world before we enter into paradise. And that's why the content of the Quran from cover to cover is speak about water, rain, environment, insects, animal, ecosystem, more than the verses about salah, zakat, hajj, siyam, and whatnot. Because the whole idea is to prepare the human being to live in this world successfully as they're going to live in the hereafter successfully. And that's what the challenge the Quran was revealed to address and to impress on the mind of the people that they have to take the Quran as a hudan, as the source of guidance to navigate the, the landscape and the SOP of this world before they can enjoy the SOP in the hereafter, this, which does not require anything from human being. Over there, everything was uh, or will be prepared by Allah. There's no need to look into the waste management, the power, the refinement, uh, sorry, the, the, the water treatment from the water asset to the uh, drinkable and affordable water, to education, to hospital, hospital treatment, ambulance and services, and what have you. So this is something that we have not been encouraged and taught uh, to think about the future. Whereas in the Quran, Alhamdulillah, I think Prof. Uh, Kamal Hassan has mentioned a few and I'm, I'm trying to repeat some of them uh, in my introductory remark. Uh, the most beautiful uh, verse uh, from my perspective would be 
the ayah from Al Hashar. Ya ayuh aladin amanu ittaqullaha wa tanzul nafsun ma qaddamat ligadin wa taqullaha inna Allah khabiru bima ta'amalun. O you who believe, uh, be mindful of Allah. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let every soul diligently ponder what is strive for tomorrow. And this is the key word. Tanzur uh, in Arabic, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, in Arabic uh, original word of Tanzur is, is, is more than thinking, is to ponder, to contemplate. Uh, of course, perhaps diligently, holistically, seriously, what lies ahead uh, for the future, not only in terms of uh, you know, our destiny in the hereafter, but also our destiny in this world in terms of poverty, uh, affordability of houses, uh, employability, uh, opportunities, and what have you. So issues are, are many on the ground. So this is a very beautiful eye about uh, the futurist mindset that we need to reinterpret and re uh, uh, orientate uh, in our uh, teaching syllabus and, and curricula, if you like. Then uh, I would like to quote, uh, you know, the case of uh, Yusuf Ali Salam, uh, uh, when uh, he was asked about the dream of the king, Al-Malik, and uh, one of the verses, uh, 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 I mean, uh, the, I mean, one of the uh, leak of the dream the king was uh, you know seeing in his dream about the uh, you know the the seven uh, uh, fat cows were eaten by the seven you know uh, small cow for that matter and Rabbi Yusuf was Prophet Yusuf was saying that that shows in the next five uh, I mean after five after seven years of prosperity they will come seven years of you know drought and and, and difficulty and hardship. ثم يأتي بعد ذلك سبع شداد يأكلن ما قدمتم لهن إلا قليلا مما تحصنون. So that within or during the, the the difficult seven years, you eat what you need to eat or you you need to survive for that matter. Uh, everything that you have thought for the last seven years, إلا قليلا مما تحصنون except a little. Uh, which you have thought, uh, I mean, among the seed to be planted and grown in the future. So this is about the futurist mindset. You can eat whatever, uh, I mean, uh, you have to eat using the storage of the last uh, seven years of storage, but make sure you keep aside uh, a portion of seed to plant, because if you eat everything, then there's no uh, genome and seed for the plantation of the future. And uh, the last verse that I need, uh, that I would like to quote, there are many other verses. That's why when Prof. Kamal mentioned about the, the studies of future, we need to uh, first and foremost collect and curate all the Quranic verses and the hadith about the future so that we are guided by our uh, epistemological uh, hierarchy of guidance, which is the Wahyu, the revelation. Uh, Surah Al Kafi, قال هذا رحمة من ربي. Uh, the Zakonain was quoted or saying in the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قَالَ هَذَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّي فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّ وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّ uh, And Zakonain uh, said, this is a mercy from my Lord uh, when uh, the promise of my Lord comes or came, he will raise this barrier or this wall to the ground. And uh, indeed, my Lord promise always come true. And what is the, 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 the takeaway message from this ayah is about Zulqarnayn was predicting about the future. Even the technology will become obsolete uh, in the future. And he was, from my own perspective, he was hinting to us through the kalamullah, to the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the technology cannot sustain forever. There will be new technology and there will be new discovery. And when the time comes, the, the, the Great Wall of Zulqarnay will collapse uh, eventually. And that shows the mindset that whatever we have today cannot be sustained forever. We need to reform. We need to progress all the time to keep up uh, with, the, with the, uh, the technology of the time and the requirement of the hour. 
Alhamdulillah, these are the few uh, Quranic verses uh, I managed to uh, quote and cite from the, from the Quran. Of course, when we look to the Hadith, there are many other uh, marvelous and amazing uh, words of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So coming back to the, to the issue of the, 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 the talk on the future of Islam or the future study of Islam. In 2017, uh, I went to Singapore. I was invited to go to the, the biggest, uh, 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 you, uh, you know, the, the super competing company in, in Singapore, in this part of the world, uh, Microsoft. And they have, uh, they have started developing the smart learning machine. So I took the challenge to uh, uh, scan and put my paper, which I was, uh, uh, which I had prepared and presented in in Bahrain in the World Bank conference on the Sharia study on gold trading, and that within two one minutes, uh, uh, the the smart machine learning can interpret who is the author and what kind of message I'm trying to uh, convey, uh, what would be the good thing and bad thing uh, in bracket compared to the million of the data of the world against my choice of word, my choice of construction, my choice of argument and whatnot. Uh, put aside the, the academic part of it, I was uh, keen to look how the data of the world uh, was uh, developed uh, uh, to reflect the acceptability of Islam in the world at large. And true enough, uh, the data, the smart machine learning was capturing the word Sharia, because I mentioned about Sharia a few times in my paper. All of the comment on Sharia was negative, was ugly, was black, because the data in the mindset of the people of the world, either in the printed or unprinted document, Sharia is always bad. And this is something we need to address, how to make the Sharia white and beautiful again in the future. But somehow, in the same paper, uh, this is only one paper, uh, just imagine if you put all the Quran or the Sunnah or the books of the scholars in the smart machine learning, you can see the beauty of Islam through the, the, the smart learning machine. I think people can see Islam better. This is the point I wanted to come a bit later. Uh, the same paper, the same smart learning uh, process was uh, able to show that whenever I, I use the word uh, Sharia robust or robust Sharia framework or Sharia governance, it has uh, all the tremendous uh, appraisal and praise by the data of the world to say that they like the word of governance, uh, framework, you know, uh, diligent and what have you. So this is how powerful the data is to shape the mindset of the world. I think with that, I would like, I would like to move on to the next uh, part of my presentation, Dr. Azam. Uh, in this presentation, uh, I would like to focus on two uh, big uh, dimension. The first, the study of Islam within our own circle, how do we take up the agenda and the subject matter of future studies within our circle, within our fraternity, which Prof. Kamal uh, did also highlight toward the end of his speech. Yes, we can be a uh, critic to the West, but uh, the best uh, effort is to criticize, uh, to be critical of our own uh, uh, state of affairs, if you like. And the second dimension, how does Islam uh, deal and uh, you know interact with the whole world in the next 50 years or uh, uh, or more in the future? Uh, from my own uh, humble understanding of the future studies, I have listed uh, five important selling features uh, in order for anyone to undertake the future studies of anything, uh, be it in the Islamic studies or in science and technology or even in sociology, anthropology and what have you. Uh, these uh, uh, five important features or characteristics are to be incorporated uh, in the whole exercise. First, uh, the study should be predictive and prescriptive. Uh, should be able to predict and should be able to prescribe uh, what to be done or what should be avoided to avoid what is being predicted initially or uh, you know in the initial part of our prediction so the pre the predictive mind and the prescriptive mind must come together there's no point of doing future studies uh, whereby we are not able to predict and to prescribe how to deal with the future good or bad second element 
is data driven. We need to rely very much on data because how good are we? We are not able to understand all the trends of the world, economic, weather, climate, poverty, education, employment, uh, the, the quality of soil, the quality of uh, fertilizer, the quality of the genome, the weather control, the traffic. We can't analyze everything. Though we are coming together, we cannot because this is the job that the supercomputer can do better, the back end. We are good in ideation, but we need something to help us to provide and to analyze the million and billion of data of the world, which is even ourselves, we have million of our own data to reflect who are we uh, in terms of personality. In the 2017 paper, I think the smart machine learning has captured about 1000 uh, features of my personality, uh, good and bad, uh, within or during that particular one paper. So data driven and we need to be uh, mindful of qualitative and quantitative as well as synthetic data. Uh, every term has their own definition. Uh, the time uh, is not uh, in my favor to, uh, uh, to illustrate the very meaning and essence of qualitative and quantitative and synthetic. But uh, I have seen, or we have seen, generally speaking, uh, in the past, people like to uh, give attention to uh, quantitative numbers and figures. But nowadays, uh, we have seen in the current, the last five years, the quali quantitative, qualitative data becoming more important. So all the you know social data, or the behavioral data, or the attitude data, or the mindset data are much more powerful than the quantitative data, and that uh, was proven in many apps of the world. Uh, the Amazon, be it the uh, you know the the. The, the 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 Alibaba and and so on so because they leverage on the uh, qualitative data more than quantitative data they are both, both are important but when it come to decisioning and and preference and charting the future of the whatever uh, e-commerce or direction of the world the qualitative data seem to be more in control and more influencing at the end of the day the third it should be objective and unbiased. Uh, we cannot be doing future studies where we are not that objective. Uh, even we have to be critical of our own state of affairs within our community, and we cannot be whitewashing either. So we need to be very, very objective and uh, open-minded. And of course, multidisciplinary, uh, Dr. Azam mentioned in his opening speech, uh, uh, I mean, this is what I have seen uh, the great author of Michio Kaku, uh, the American physicist, originally from Japan. He uh, is known for his great book in the future studies. He was so data-driven, objective, and very uh, uh, multidisciplinary. He, he, he knows mathematics of the world, physics of the world, uh, you know, the, 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 solo, the sociology of the world. He, he, he understand the Thomas Hobbes and the Sigmund Freud uh, school of thought. He blend everything to create uh, what uh, he would predict uh, the future uh, for the world. And the last but not least, the power of instinct. So uh, at the end of the day, we need to uh, develop and train our young people, if even ourselves, to be able to provide some uh, intuitive power of thinking uh, in understanding the future. Okay, the third part of my presentation uh, some of the uh, observation uh, when we talk about the future study in Islam within our own community, within our own fraternity uh, uh, as we speak. And uh, somehow we are, uh, you know, we are confronted with the prevailing secularism uh, and the animosity of the world, not to mention the divided and ignorant world citizen. These are the pain points of the world. Though we have achieved so many great achievements, but we can't uh, deny the, the, the onslaught of ignorance, the how divided are we, and the animosity between the great powers and the, uh, and, the and the following members of the great powers of the world, and secularism within and without our uh, community, Muslim community. So the study of Islam, in brief, uh, Dr. Azam uh, tried to finish uh, as soon as possible to allow more time for interaction. Um, 
uh, I would I would argue very much that um, in order for us to see the future, we have to start from now, and we need to uh, uh, refine our textbook and our uh, you know books from uh, very much uh, relying on textbook and mechanical definition of everything. We need to move on to clinical and functional definition of everything, even for akhlaq, even for what more to ahkam, what more to the, you know, uh, uh, ishtihad and whatnot. We need to give a more clinical and functional definition of amana, of ikhlas, of uh, being accountable rather than a very textbook and very mechanical definition which has no value at all. I think the future studies will be more tangible. Uh, this is the, the whole idea. The tangibility will be the new feature of the future. Everything should be tangible and cannot be so abstract and so utopian and so uh, untouchable, uh, quote and unquote, uh, if you were to move forward. So we need to define everything so that people can see that that definition is very much alive. It's a living organism. We have to make every single thing in Islamic studies a living organism so that it lives in the society, it lives with us, it interacts with us as if the amana is talking to us. The very uh, visualization of amana is very much close to the heart of the Muslim and, and everyone in this world. So moving away from textbook and uh, mechanical definition to clinical and uh, functional uh, outlook of the discipline. Second element, um, analytics and digitalized Islam or Sharia. Uh, again, to make Islam and Sharia more uh, understandable and more appreciated by the, uh, the, the world citizen, I think we need to move ahead to make our books and our, of course, even the Quran and the Sunnah digitalized so people can straight away apply the analytics to the Quran and to the Sunnah. And that will, for the first time ever, for the first time ever, the Quran will be very much vividly clear in the eyes of everyone in this world, including non muslim because the moment they can see the data of rain in the Quran, the water in the Quran, the, the mention about Prophet about al akhirah 150 times, this is something easy in the future. There's no need for you to count and to do what have you. You can put the word and search and you can play around with the derivative or the meaning and try to connect one verse with another and one chapter with another and to compare the meaning of, for example, uh, a rush prudent uh, in the Quran to the, to, the, to the data of the world. You can see how relevant the meaning of rush or prudent in, uh, again, the data of the world in terms of financial prudent, uh, you know, uh, government uh, prudent and what have you uh, in that context. So everything can be make, uh, uh, you know, analytics and uh, digital uh, uh, and it can be, uh, it can help everyone to understand the Quran faster, uh, more structured and, uh, uh, and quicker, I would say. I mean, this is something we have, as well, we need to go to the tafsir and the tafsir is some, something documented in the books, but if you put everything, we can link back to the very meaning of the Quran and the Sunnah uh, digitally. I think that is a new revolution of Islam of the future. The third, uh, uh, I think in the past, uh, uh, in Muslim society, uh, we were trapped in many, uh, uh, you know, mantra or many uh, subject mindset, which we like to do it. Uh, and we prefer to continue doing it for many, many years. We have been doing that for the last how many decades. For example, the theme of Wehdatul uh, Ummah, the, the, the unity of the Ummah. And we like that word very much. Uh, whereas uh, in the Quran, we look at the data of the Quran from cover to cover. The issue of Wehdatul Ummah, the unity of the Ummah, is less compared to another important theme of that's why we need to, to to see the data of the quran to see what is the most prevailing and the most uh, uh, important message of anything that we are doing or we plan to do uh, it, according to the ummah for example is more of empowering ummah the word of empowering ummah uh, has been uh, mentioned either directly or indirectly to show that 
the moment we make our ummah empowered, we can resolve so many uh, ikhtilaf and khilaf and disagreement. But we talk about something abstract, not tangible. Unity is, is not tangible. The meaning of unity is not tangible. But empowerment, we need to put the policies, the measures, the follow-up, the indicators, the KPI, and what have you. And true enough, uh, in Surah Yusuf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about Prophet Yusuf four times about uh, empowerment, makanna, uh, that we have empowered the Prophet Yusuf to be uh, a man of uh, authority. Uh, and this is the meaning of Islam Ummah moving forward. So uh, we need to uh, be selective in our work to prepare our, 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 our Ummah to go to the future. Fourth, which is quite important, impact measurement. Uh, uh, to move uh, ahead in the future, we cannot take things for granted anymore. Anything should be accounted for. One dollar spent should be accounted for. And to see the impact of zakat and contribution and scholarship and salaries and uh, you know uh, infrastructure fund and uh, maintenance fund and whatnot. Everything should be looked in great detail. In the past, many people got escaped because it's quite impossible to uh, to uh, to do the impact measurement in great detail. But nowadays, with the data, with the GPS, and with whatever we have in terms of technology, every single uh, dollar spent can be measured, and every single piece of uh, uh, you know waste you put aside along the road can be captured by the great camera or uh, you know uh, techno, high tech, tech camera and what have you so the impact measurement would be the way forward and the last but not least um, uh, i would say the study of islam should be uh, subjected from today to national sorry to natural language processing and natural language generation so that we can automatically give the meaning of everything we read in the Quran and the Sunnah, a meaning that is supported by the data of Islamic knowledge in how many thousand and million of books plus the data of, 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 of today, of life at the moment. So it become very real and very, uh, you know, structured in our understanding. Uh, of course, we have the option not to do it, but we tend to delay the future for a great Islamic civilization in the future. Uh, Dr. Azam, last five minutes, uh, if you can allow me. Uh, Islam and the, and the world. Uh, how does Islam uh, to deal with the world in the next 50 years or from now, perhaps? I think, um, I, I mean, I, I like to predict that uh, the 5.0 uh, IR uh, is a great thing for Islam in the future because you can see nowadays people are connected to one another. The ways and the means of communication uh, have been made possible, which are otherwise uh, blocked and prevented and, uh, you know, uh, put aside uh, by many great powers of the world. But nowadays, Alhamdulillah, the connectivity uh, has become the new religion. Uh, allow me to use the word new, new religion, because everyone is connected to one another. No more superpower that can block anything in terms of information, in terms of uh, knowledge in terms of uh, data and ideas. So this is the great thing of Islam. Islam was suppressed because Islam was not able to communicate, was not able to make a connection to the whole world. And perhaps this is the very meaning of uh, the verse of Al-Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created men uh, uh, from, you know, uh, men and women and from different tribe and nation, the ta'arafu, so that they can be connected to one another, just not to know one another, but to be connected. And uh, the technology has come to help us to be connected. And I can see that when we are connected, Islam can strive further, provided we have something to sell to the whole world. We have something, a good narrative to sell to the whole world. We were blocked in the, far, in the past because we don't have the means, but uh, this is something going to change. Uh, provided we have a good narrative to share with the whole world, I think the Islam will be more respected, will be more perhaps understood better because we have all the communication. And the second element is nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is not only limited to, uh, you know, medicine and the medical treatment. Nano should be uh, applied across the board. When you do something, the impact of doing that thing will go down 
all the way to give the impact to the desired part of the body or even of the society. This is the nano. And Islam is always about looking into something. When we talk about adab, we talk about akhla, we talk about uh, you know, good uh, attitude, it should be of nano in character. It can help the, 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 the one who is suffering from the opposite attitude uh, and can empower uh, the person to be a better uh, person by having a nano uh, module of akhla and not to mention the financial nano, the, the political system, uh, the environment uh, management, if we can use the nano, if we were to omit, uh, if you we were to, sorry, to produce, let's say, every single day, um, few tons of carbon dioxide, we can see the impact already on our river. This is the nano. So everything that we do must be, uh, we can measure the impacts uh, through the nano technology uh, on the whole environment. And nano is something uh, we have to celebrate uh, the coming of nano in the future because uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, uh, we hope that uh, we envisage the nano can make Islam better appreciated. For haq to be prevailing, we need to make the haq very transparent, very clear in the mind of our uh, world citizen. Uh, in the interest of the time, I will stop at the last point, uh, the future of the world and how Islam uh, would deal with the future of the world is for Islam to be able to offer personalized solution. Uh, the general uh, prescription was effective in the past. The khutbah, the sermon, the teaching, the university, the, re the research, perhaps they were great in the past. They were able to uh, make people behave well, but in the future, uh, looking into the trend, everyone is having a personalized device a personalized profiling, a personalized shopping list, a personalized, uh, you know, preference, a personalized everything in the system that uh, we are having at the moment. I I'm predicting that for Islam to be relevant in the future, Islam, the Muslim, intellectual, and everyone in the society must be able to offer a personalized solution to everyone, the Muslim and non-Muslim alike. I think with that, uh, Dr. Azam, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity for me to say a few words uh, in this important session. I would like to thank Prof. Kamal Hassan for gracing the, the, the session to uh, share his uh, point of view and for me to be given the opportunity to contribute the little that I know uh, the way I see the future from my own experience in many aspect of practice uh, in addition to the knowledge and writing and what have you. So thank you very much and thank you everyone for your kind listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much indeed, Prof. Uh, Dr. Baka. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and I think uh, you are sharing what you are now doing. Uh, in the real world, in the real life, taking into the what would be the future uh, for, for us as a Muslims in the real life of the, of the world in the next 50 years. And you have shared quite a number of important points uh, pertaining to, uh, to this. And I think everything that you have shared, I think, would be something that Islam has to be look into a wider perspective. I think the technology, the investment of what we have, I mean, we, we need to use it a, a, as a platform for the betterment of the Ummah. And, and I think uh, you started with your presentation on the, as well as what Prof. Kamal has mentioned that I think when we talk about Islam, it is not only for this world, but for the after, but it has to start. It has to start from this world. Otherwise, we're not going to go to the hereafter. And then it is a very important, uh, I mean, point that you have mentioned. I don't want to uh, repeat it. I think, I think everyone can take, has taken note of that. I think uh, we'll be sharing that in, in our event reports, inshallah, both in our journal as well as our bulletin. Um, 
I would like to have this uh, following session taking questions from viewers, both from the Zoom participants as well as the uh, FB viewers. Um, the first questions came from Nur Iman, and it addressed to both of you, Prof. Kamal Hassan and also Dr. Daud. Uh, this is with regard, I tried to uh, summarize this, uh, I mean, questions, it's a quite long question. In 2016, Yuan Noah Harari suggested in his book, Almost Deals, that mm -hmm. the world's most valuable resource of the future is no longer oil, but data. So in the extreme form, proponents of data in its worldview perceive the entire universe as the flow of data. See organism as little more than uh, bio, uh, biochemical algorithm and believe that humanity's cosmic vocation is to create an all-composing data processing systems and then merge into it. So the, 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 what would be the important point of this question is, dataism might in fact turn out to be the new religion. You mentioned, uh, Dr. Daub, about this new religion of the future. What is your take on this? Prof, Prof Kamal, Hassan, please. Okay. Uh, the, the older of the two. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have much to say. Uh, when it comes to data, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that uh, you know, has all the data that you need. But I am more concerned not with, the, uh, you know, with dataism, but with uh, Harariism. Okay. Uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, is an Israeli uh, historian who has written uh, three, three uh, books uh, which, have be, which became bestsellers uh, in many uh, countries and translated into, I think, maybe 13 million yeah. copies. And homogeous is, is among one of them. Yeah. Uh, you have to understand that uh, he's popular, I think, because uh, his personality resonates with uh, many of the young people around the world who do not believe in God, who are homosexuals. And um, uh, Yuval himself um, um, admitted uh, without any um, uh, tinge of uh, um, shame or um, embarrassment that he is married to a man. Uh, and that man is his manager. Uh, so he says, my husband manages uh, my, my talks. Uh, he has about 12, 15 uh, officers or workers helping him in his office. So um, you know, from, from this kind of mind, which already rejects God as, as, as an old story, he talks of when we talk about narrative, he talks of stories. Uh, history is made up of stories. Uh, the old story is that there is a God, but the new story is that there's no God. Uh, so he is a, a social Darwinist, uh, uh, and uh, maybe also a um, uh, scientist who, who uh, believes that science can solve all the problems. Um, so of course he's worried about the future of AI, that, uh, you know, uh, it might get out of control. Um, so I, um, uh, however, uh, um, I, of course, I think uh, Datuk Dao will, will address this issue of dataism as, as the new religion. Um, but to me, uh, I'm afraid that uh, Harari uh, will become the new prophet. So I will stop there and uh, let the, my, my, my younger brother <laughs> to take the, <laughs> the brunt of, of this uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Prof. Kamal Hassan. Uh, Dr. Daud, please. Yeah, I think uh, I'm intrigued by the interesting uh, usage of data by Harry Kessinger, of course, in favor of American and uh, American colonialism and hegemonism around the world. 
uh, when Nixon, Nixon, I think they need to fight in Vietnam and they cannot be printing money as easy as they wanted because it was backed by gold then. And Nixon was uh, under pressure to release, release yeah, the, the, the US dollar from the gold back, the gold, the gold back. And he did that and uh, because he wanted to uh, sponsor the, the budget in uh, the, the war budget in, in Vietnam. And next day, as you know, uh, the US dollar dropped significantly. It has no it had no value. It value was for about three to four years. And uh, Nixon sent over uh, uh, Harry Kissinger as a Jewish, uh, you know, uh, individual to uh, Saudi <laughs> to see uh, and to discuss with the Saudi, uh, the chairman of OPEX. And uh, and interestingly, in the many reports, uh, the, uh, the Harry Kissinger was quoting a very great data to convene the Saudi then, the chairman of OPEX, to start using all the do, all the oil transaction using the dollar. Otherwise, dollar has no backup. And until today, the US dollar uh, is strong because of the used to be the uh, oil-based transaction. Now, everything in the world, when we have the trade to trade or country to country transaction, you have to have the uh, the money to go through the New York Bank for one or two nights. They call it uh, uh, they call it they call it nostro account. Otherwise, you cannot transfer money from Malaysia to London and vice versa. So this is how they have used the data for their benefit, even to, to save their own currency. That's why the data is so powerful. Uh, without looking into who is Harari for that matter, I think the data should be used by Muslims to, to understand and to put our hand on the heart to, to really look into the, the pain point of the society and to move on and put the, the right prescription. Um, and uh, uh, when it comes to Israel uh, uh, as a state, I think the best seller, the best yeah, seller book I have ever written is uh, called the Nation State, and they have put ten vertical. How can Israel be independent from the rest of the world in uh, ten vertical oil and military and education and even water? There's one chapter on water in the book. And they managed to, to do it now. And they, they are using every single thing to create, uh, you know, uh, to create the success from scarcity. And this is the book that I think every scholar of Muslim school must read because not to uh, put them on the center stage, but to understand how they plan the country to become one of the great countries in the world. Even in sport nowadays, they are coming up uh, uh, in doing great in sport because they are using data. So, uh, all in all, uh, uh, Dr. Azam and also Prof. Kamal, I think uh, uh, we need to Islamize our data and we need to put our data uh, 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 to work for us and not against us. Otherwise, we're going to be defe defeated again as uh, Harry Kessinger has you know, done great to save the US dollar all the way until today. So this is, uh, from that moment, I realized that data is so powerful and we have to um, you know uh, uh, you uh, make the data as one or one uh, course in our university because we are started by data whenever we come in the morning uh, full of data is coming to us and we don't know how to analyze the data and that is uh, a wastage of information and yeah thank you Dr. Azam. Okay, thank you Daud. Uh, we move to the second question by Mr. Muhammad Azad Ahsani Lukman. Uh, how can we benefit from Western technological investment to build our own future, at the same time restrict our minds and acts from the philosophical underpinnings of Western worldwide culture and values? I think uh, this, I think he the, did not uh, mention uh, any of the speakers to respond, but I think I open it to both speakers to respond. The okay, let me take the uh the the lead um yeah because uh, the main person is the younger man uh to answer this uh yes i uh, i indicated in my presentation the, uh, and i quoted uh, the technological predictions 17 technological predictions uh, from the world economic forum uh, which are all very useful uh, predictions mm. We, uh, 
we are laggers when it comes to technology. And therefore, uh, we have to go all the distance to get the technology. That technology is hikmah. And uh, so take it wherever you find it, even from Israel. Maybe Israel can produce water from the desert. Why not? We can learn from, from the Israelis. But when it comes to the ideologies, uh, the philosophical underpinnings, uh, the Iman, then of course we have our Tawheed uh, as the supreme guide. So our values, um, uh, reveal values, and we are not going to uh, sacrifice um, any of these revealed values for the sake of technological expediency. Uh, so um, uh, even I say yes, we go go unto China. You know, uh, there is a saying, "Utul bil ilma wala bil sin." So utul bil technologia wala bil sin. Uh, but don't take the Chinese uh, religion and don't take the Chinese uh, communist philosophy. So we have to have that kind of, of wisdom uh, to, uh, to choose, uh, to be selective in our attitude towards technology. Uh, 17 technologies uh, produced, uh, I mean, predicted by uh, World Economic Forum are, are all acceptable to me. They're all halal. Um, but if they are uh, inventing something to change the gender of, of a woman to man uh, or a man to a woman and they're coming up with uh, nano nanotechnology, uh, genetic engineering, uh, biological engineering, what have you, uh, to change the nature, uh, that, that is, that is uh, haram technology. Uh, so, um, uh, and also, you know, um, all kinds of uh, technological inventions, you have to also apply uh, the, the, the principle of selectivity based on what's halal and haram, based on our maqasid uh, sharia. Okay, now uh, the younger man will speak longer, inshallah. Thank you very much, Prof. Come on. <laughs> I think I cannot agree more with uh, what Prof. Kamal has uh, elucidated just now. That is a very balanced approach. We need to be the best in terms of technology, the best in terms of our foundation of knowledge and Islam. And this is uh, no two way about it. We have to be uh, equally great in both aspects. In fact, uh, Dr. Azam, uh, uh, in my point, I have uh, jotted down, uh, in the second dimension of my speech uh, just now, the state of Islam and the world, uh, I have put one of the features, one of the pillars uh, is science technology of Islam. In the future, for Islam to be relevant and to be futurist in character, we need to uh, relook into our syllabus from now on in our school and uh, university, uh, how can we make science technology uh, uh, very much entrenched in our education. I'm not saying the hard sciences, even the soft sciences, should be embedded with science and technology. Uh, this is something uh, uh, I think I have seen that uh, in the in the school in the Islamic civilization in the past. They 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 they, they were not secularists. The scholar of Islam, they were scholar of fiqh and scholar of medicine and scholar of and what have you. Uh, nowadays we become the scholar of one knowledge without the other knowledge. And this is a new uh, disparity of uh, Islamic uh, knowledge civilization. So we need to reintroduce uh, re, uh, re, uh, back the right syllabus in the mind of our young people so that uh, when, they, uh, when they graduate, they are very much exposed to the, the sign of Islam and the sign of technology at the same time. So this is what I'm trying to uh, mission and uh, I'm not a scientist too, but I think this is something lacking because uh, Quran, uh, as mentioned by many great scholars, Quran is full of physics, more than chemistry, more than biology, but how many of our young people, even ourselves, are very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, very much uh, knowledgeable about the physics of the Quran. So this is something uh, we need to do more and moving forward, 
design technology would be one of the important uh, uh, conduit to make Islam relevant for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Daud. Can we move to the other questions? Uh, these questions came from Ahlis, eh? and the interest to both to Prof. Uh, Kamal Hassan as well as Dr. Daud. Eh? We believe that Islam should should bring rahmatan lil alamin. However, on top of pesticides and habitat loss, increased exposure to electromagnetic radiation, including 5G, is having a negative impact on the insect world. For instance, the bee population that very important for the sustained life of plants. How do you see this problem? Okay, um, Dr. Azam, uh, let me confess that I will not be able to answer this question. <laughs> so, okay, but this is uh, this is about biology and biotech. Mm. Uh, I am not a biologist nor a biotechnician nor a scientist, so I cannot answer uh, this question. Uh, how uh, the uh, you know all these things are having an adverse if impact on the insect world yeah. uh, we, but we know that uh, when we don't have insects then it's going to have affect our agriculture mm. we need bees and uh, we need also the bats now if people don't killing bats and eating bats our durian uh, uh, you know musang king may not be able to to be exported to china you see they, this is one of the great uh, you know uh, um, revenue earners for the country yeah uh, and you need more bats so uh, we hope the chinese will not continue i mean chinese in china uh, and other people will, will spare the bats but already in australia and in new zealand they are seeing also the uh, the loss of uh, of the beasts uh, and so not only you're going to have less honey but uh, uh, Bees carry the pollen from uh, flower to flower, from fruit trees. So f fruit trees will not be fruiting if, if, the, if the pollen from the flowers are not taken to another flower, the male flower with the female flower uh, producing uh, the fruit and all that. So yeah, that much I can talk as a layman, but um, um, I'm not a scientist, so let uh, Dr. Daud uh, handle this question. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Kama Hassan. Dr. Daud, please. Um, I'm not a scientist uh, either, uh, but let me share uh, some of the, you know, the power of uh, technology. Uh, I think in Australia, when they do the, uh, when, do, when, do, when they spray the insecticides uh, using the plane, not the human, uh, you know, workers, they use the infrared to identify which, uh, uh, which one of the plant might, or is having uh, insects eating the leaf and whatnot. So they're very selective so that the, 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 the impacts of the chemical-based insecticide does not pollute the, the richness of the soil and that soil can go on for many, many years. And this is technology, how technology can deal with even the insect which uh, destroyed the plant uh, in Australia and, and New Zealand. Take the China, for example, they are big countries and uh, the biggest problem in China is food, to be honest. So they do have enough supply of food, that's why they need to buy big land outside China, Canada, Australia, to, 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 to look into the ecosystem of food supply. This is. In the Quran, food supply is very important, repeated 100 times about the food supply in the Quran. In order to become a great country, we need to look after our food supply, which is not the case in Malaysia. 85% of food items are imported, which is very, very bad, very dangerous. If we have, uh, you know, the pandemic more than, more than six months, and we're going to be, you know, uh, having a lot of crisis. So in China, they wanted to produce more they uh, spray the insecticides uh, uh, without any uh, technology. And now, uh, one third, uh, even half of the land in China are barren. Uh, they, they, they plant anything 
there's no fruit. Uh, if there's a fruit, the uh, production for, uh, for for time for metric, uh, time will be reduced. So they, they're, they're having a lot of problems. So technology can be either way, the greed and the use of the technology. In, in the case of bee and uh, mosquito and whatnot, I'm sure we need to do a lot of research. 5G is very important because 5G is about uh, bringing the, the bandwidth closer to one another. You can download faster. There's no, in, there's no disturbance like we are having now. Prof Kama sometimes we lose his voice. I, I'm talking, my voice is not clear enough because this technology, we need to upgrade the level. But we need to create another technology that can diffuse the impact of the technology on the ecosystem. I have a friend who invented, um, you know, they call fresh, uh, freshness sticker. Uh, he has done the research using the honey for about three years. He mortgaged his property, his car, he almost bankrupt, but he managed to get the, the solution. When he, we put the sticker on the fruit, the fruit can stay one week longer than the normal fruit from being attacked by the bacteria. So this is technology. So again, the sustainability that can make food uh, uh, long, uh, ever sustainable. And that's why uh, this kind of topic is very important in our you know, discussion to make Islam more relevant in the future. Yes, it's a challenge, but we have to take the challenge proportionately, Dr. Azam. Okay, thank you. Allow me to finish this uh, question that you given to us. I think we have four more questions. Yeah. Uh, we, we, before we wrap up our session uh, tonight. Huh? This question comes from Dr. Barry, uh, who, who is from, um, the, uh, he got it from a viewer. Uh, as the adverse climate change impacts on the world seems to be inevitable, what does Sharia say about the interplanetary exploration initiative as some have seen it as the only option for the future of humanity. So who would like to uh, respond why not, to that? Why, why don't we ask uh, Dr. Dao to, to reply? Because that's about the Sharia, and he is the, yeah. he, he is the great uh, sheikh, uh, the contemporary uh, sheikh without the turban. So he, he can answer this very easily. Uh, I wanted to start Prof Kamal by sharing a joke. Uh, when I was giving a uh, you know, a religious uh, sermon uh, in the mosque, what, 10, 15 years ago, or perhaps longer than that, uh, some of the ma'mum of the, you know, the jama'ah the, uh, was asking me, uh, Dr. Daud, if we were to go to mass uh, later on, and uh, if we were to pray later on, how are we going to face our face to the Qibla when we are <laughs> on, on mass? Uh, I was a bit cynical to this question. He was he was futurist. I'm not futurist then. I was a cynical scholar. I said to him, uh, "Look, my uncle. He's older than me. Look, my uncle. If you go there and you land in on Mars, give me a call. Only then I can." <laughs> but nowadays people are talking. I think uh, Sir Sir Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, and. Uh, Tesla uh, founder, uh, uh, Alan Musk. Uh, these are the two human beings on this planet talking about, uh, you know, uh, 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 journey to, to, to beyond the uh, moon and whatnot. I think if, if Prof. Kamal, I'm correct me, I'm wrong, if I were asked about the fatwa of going there, I have no issue. In fact, the more we travel uh, out there, the more we can see the i'ajaz, the get, the, 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 the ayat min ayatillah, more uh, more evident than this world, perhaps. So this is something that we have to open up the galaxy. We have to allow people to travel, of course, with the proper risk management, but uh, uh, either for for climate uh, impact ma management or beyond for, they call it, uh, 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 they call it um, uh, you know, the, 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 the sky uh, traveling, whatever it is, uh, kind of uh, activity by some people, but uh, we, we can't stop people and we should be uh, sending our own uh, rocket to overseas to find planet and to find ayat min ayatila. There are many other ayat min ayatila which are not yet unlocked. So this is let people go out and see the world and see what the Quran says about the whole galaxy. But before we go that, I think uh, there are many other technology that we can look after the water treatment in, in, in Malaysia. Even in Malaysia, I'm deeply involved in water treatment through my own research. Uh, the, the old technology of using chemical is very much detrimental to the environment. 
uh, and not efficient enough, 30% of the raw water will go back to the river and the lake, where in developed countries they use the membrane technology, uh, very sophisticated filtering that can uh, refine up to 95% raw water. It saves electricity, it produces more water, and this is the new technology for Malaysia and Islamic countries moving forward. So there are many other ways of, of even in Malaysia, we have rain, but we don't store our rain. It goes, uh, you know, wild. Whereas in India, they put a very big reservoir. Uh, they have turned water into industry. They sell to Middle East. Why can't we do, this, do the same thing? There are many buyers uh, buying the uh, raw water uh, from Kalimantan, from Indonesia, from uh, Sulawesi, from India, but not from Malaysia. It's quite unfortunate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Daud. Uh, we move to this question. I think this must be perhaps also, perhaps maybe Dr. Daud can answer this. Uh, question from Mr. Ahmed. Uh, what are the tools, software or apps related to big data, analytics or artificial intelligence that you know which are now available to assist researchers for future studies and data analytics? Uh, I missed the first few words of this, the question. What are the tools, tools. software, uh, tools, mm -hmm. software or apps related to big data? There are plenty of them in the market. Uh, uh, they are, some of them are free, some of them are available on pay-per-use concept. When you pay, when you use, you have to pay, and some of them you need to onboard uh, 100% and make it API to your system, connected to your system. System. So uh, this is not the right time for me to uh, give the, the detail, but you can Google. Uh, there are many uh, uh, you know, producers of AI and big data. I have three different companies just on AI. We have one on spot data. We look into our athlete performance in Malaysia. We look into the data of their clothes, their, their diet, their, their thinking process the equipment, racket, badminton racket, and whatnot. So we look into that in detail to produce better athletes. I have another one in remittance, uh, where to remit the money, and also on zakat collection and, and distribution. We, we managed to upgrade the zakat uh, fitrah collection during the pandemic using the smart data to target the right people. And at the right time uh, of the day, we could be no the data what time they are closer to God for them to pay zakat. So, even to that extent, so we managed to do that. Uh, but uh, I think you can PM me, you can email to me, the brother who asked me, more than happy to share a, a bit more uh, detail and, and prescription if you like. If you don't mind, what will be that that that, that time for the people very closer to God? Is it through, through the last 10 days? No. Last 10 days of Ramadan? 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning, Durak Ramadan. <laughs> oh, I see. Ramadan, okay. yes. 70% okay. of, of zakat uh, payers pay between 2 to 3 uh, a.m. in the morning. Oh, okay. Marvelous. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this question from Sam Jell, uh, uh, I mean, addressed to both speakers. Eh? Uh, I have one short question. Muslim population is almost 2 billion or more, but non-Islamic countries or Muslim countries are able to make COVID vaccines for ourselves, not counting Saudi Arabia and Iran. Can we put hope on Malaysia, Turkey or Qatar for that? for the next 10 years as a future study or aim to achieve any response for that both uh, presenters please uh, i think uh, i request that to doubt <laughs> um, i think um, uh, uh, i have to be very careful over here because you know the muslim countries we tend to uh, buy overseas product uh, and uh, we don't do our own clinical tests uh, in the country. In fact, in Malaysia, there's no uh, lab to do the antiviral test. I have checked with all the university, including our own university, uh, uh, URA and many other great universities. We don't have even the equipment and the lab to test the antivirus, any, any medicine that can be proven to kill the, the human coronavirus. We don't have that in the entire Malaysia. So I'm not sure about other, other, other Muslim countries. So this is how backward are we in terms of virus uh, management. And virus is becoming a common feature of the world. Every six months, every one year, every three years. And China is now building uh, the quarantine centers 
thousand of them as if they are predicting the the emergence of new uh, you know virus in the future having said that without going to the detail uh, uh, i cannot say uh, on, on 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 my company but we have discovered uh, uh, a formulation uh, using 100% herbs uh, based on the uh, you know uh, 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 they call it um, uh, one of the you know kelapa uh, muda what they call it the young coconut oil the young coconut oil uh, and uh, we have gone through the us uh, lab test it proven to have killed uh, the human coronavirus 99.999% so again we we have to uh, roll it out to the other authority but it's, it's quite difficult because uh, you know uh, at the moment uh, people thought only chemical can kill uh, the bacteria and the virus whereas in the whole history of islam uh, ibn sina and what not uh, they have practiced differently they practice the herb based medicine to kill bacteria during that time so we have to be open uh, but inshallah i think we have heard some research in in thailand they have found some uh, solution in manila in philippine in fact in malaysia perhaps uh, uh, my own product uh, called bio extreme inshallah is the process of being uh, developed uh, with uitm your former university uh, dr azam and we are talking to all the scientists to make it happen at least for the university and to be rolled out to the other wider market uh, in malaysia and beyond thank you very much okay thank you um this question from sayuti uh, as a humankind, once again, move forward and making progress in terms of studying, planning and predicting futures. How are we as Muslims to stay humble, keep our humility and put faith of our futures in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this, I think perhaps Prof. Kamal Hassan can yeah. respond to this. Well, uh, of course. Um, if you are talking about Muslim scholars, um, uh, the, the, the word for scholars is ulama, uh, inclusive of uh, religious or um, worldly scholars. Um, one of the characteristics of ulama is humility. Um, and uh, uh, in Islam, uh, you always find them uh, in in Muslim history. The more the ulama know, the more they uh, become humble, because uh, more knowledge does not mean you are the producer of knowledge, but Allah is choosing you uh, to uh, provide the information, the knowledge, the wisdom. So you become a tool uh, for Allah uh, to spread knowledge. You're not really the um, uh, creator of, of knowledge as such. So uh, all uh, true Muslim scholars have that attitude. But um, the moment um, the secular model came into the Muslim world, then uh, scholars became secularized. And um, the value of humility uh, is lost because uh, competition became the, the norm. Uh, and you want to be uh, known, you want to be recognized, you want to be uh, in front of the, of, of the competitor. So then scholars lose that, that humility. So I think uh, uh, as, as Muslim scholars, uh, as I said, the more you know, the more humble you become. The more you say, Rabbi zidni ilma, or Allah increase knowledge in me. So uh, that, that is humility, because you know that you do not really own anything, and whatever knowledge you get is by the uh, by the virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is how we look at it. But you want to know more, you can read books by Al Imam Al Ghazali.
Thank you very much, Prof. Kamal Hassan. And this will be the last question for tonight's webinar. I think this uh, question perhaps uh, addressed to uh, Dr. Daud. It is from Siti Zubada Ismail. What is the right or suitable methodology in offering realistic paradigm towards making Islam as relevant uh, as relevant in the future society? Um, we need to have another session on this. Perhaps uh, we can invite all the great minds of the Muslim scholars, thinkers, philosophers, uh, and we can give them the assignment from their own, uh, you know, respective knowledge and exposure to come on the center stage and to describe what would be the right strategies in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And I'm sure you, uh, you are a uh, IUM under the leadership uh, of Prof. Kamal in terms of this research for the uh, uh, for the new era, we can put that one in one of the paper to see what be the right, uh, if you like, the low hanging fruit uh, that we can uh, strike now to make Islam more relevant uh, in the future. Uh, being relevant is the, the most difficult thing in this world. So we have to make our religion and uh, all the uh, uh, you know, institution under Islam as a religion relevant at the end of the day. So uh, I'm not ready. I, ha I don't think I have the answer to uh, that question, but I'm sure scholars collectively can come together and put, uh, let's say, 100 papers all together. And from that 100 papers, we can create uh, some idea and some uh, methodologies to make Islam relevant in education, in IT, economics, in poverty, in management of the mosque, management of science, management of what have you, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to, to be honest to them, this great, great question coming from Sister Zubaida. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I would like to thank both uh, Apparatus Professor uh, Tansri, Dr. Kamal Hassan, as well as Dato, Dr. Dr. Baka, uh, for spending your time in this wonderful webinar on Islam and Future Studies. And I think um, I just uh, take a very important point from Prof. Kamal Hassan with regard to technology. As you mentioned, technology is hikmah, uh, but it comes, but if the ideology uh, from the people that develop that technology does not suitable to us as a Muslim, we don't take, take that ideology. But we use the technology for our benefits, for our futures, especially uh, for the betterment of the Ummah. Uh, with that, on behalf of ICE Malaysia, we would like to thank everyone for watching this important and interesting discussion. Till then, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Take care and good night.